Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I'm really honored. I'm honored for that introduction. I don't know if I really earn it, uh, but also I'm honored and very um, happy to have the opportunity to present my research here at Berkeley. I actually never really, I just made it to Berkeley once before for one of the Andean meetings, and I'm happy that I made it here today, even though it was a little bit of a hassle with all the traffic that I had to face. So um, today I mainly want to talk about my work in uh, South America, especially the century, uh, Central Andes, addressing some um, of the research questions that we've heard about uh, earlier. So um, my main interest being an trained archaeologist and biologist, or what here would be a biological anthropologist, is in population history. And population history is right of a very broad term that came up several times in the history of our discipline, but it's not well defined. So I want to start to think about kind of what my definition or broader definition of population history is. Of course, paleogenomics today and ancient DNA research just recently in the last three or four, uh, four years um, had a very large boost. There's big studies coming out nearly every week where we learn new things about populations, population histories, um, migration movements and interactions of past populations all over the time. And one critique that I sometimes have with regards to the work of my colleagues is that often enough some of these more population genetic studies kind of lack the expertise of anthropology, not considering several other factors that would be necessary to actually formulate models to be tested that integrate the cultural record, the archaeological record, uh, anthropological theory, ecological data in an equal way. So we often see very simplified models or theories uh, that are tested. Of course, the nature of models and the nature of uh, the biological discipline is to operate in these simplifying um, manners. But on the other hand, since we deal with our own species, we know that we are more complex. So my overall goal is at one point to maybe find a way to address the complexity as good as possible to integrate all these interdisciplinary data points into my own research and also to create tools that allow other researchers to do that as well. So for me, population history has to do with human diversity and the forces that shape human diversity. And that, of course, especially uh, for our uh, species, is the interaction uh, between culture and biology. Culture has become part of our biology. And besides earlier approaches of biological anthropologists to see culture just as something uh, that is an adaptation, uh, adaptation to specific environmental or whatever pressures, we now know that culture actually is a driving force in our own evolution because our decisions and our um, behavior has massive impact on the environment uh, that we're living in, meaning also that our behavior can actually alter the selective pressures that act on our populations. Overall, meaning just that we have to address questions of human population history and human diversity uh, from a more ecological and feedback perspective or from the perspective of human niche construction that tries to see the role of culture in shaping um, also the human biology. So there's different aspects of course that go into it. We have evolution, dispersal, one of the things that I will mostly talk about today, general diversity and of course it all relates to health and public health and past but also in um, contemporary and future population. So one of the main questions I tried to ask uh, in my research over the years was how does ecological and socioeconomic change influence human genetic diversity and demography? And demography is a good point to start with because demography is indeed, and nobody uh, will probably say something against it, a good way to bring culture and biology together. Demography as in basic is uh, of course, biology as um, reproduction and death are biological um, uh, events. Uh, but also, of course, demography is formed and shaped by all kinds of socioeconomic and cultural features that we have to consider. So, of course, there's many ways to address these things. I can look 
uh, and the bioarchaeological repertoire has a wonderful, um, wonderful set of methods that we can use to learn about past populations and maybe also about contemporary populations related to their health, their diversity, their diets and all these factors. My specialization here, of course, is to look at uh, the genetics part or the genomics part of our species. So many or for a long time, the major approach to understand human genetic diversity has been by looking at, uh, comparative, um, uh, at contemporary populations and compare these populations in a synchronous way to each other. By that, it was possible to reconstruct major events in the overall population history of our species very well. But on the other hand, of course, this uh, approach is blind for events that have, might have altered or shaped population structures and patterns in the past. So whatever we see now might be actually a product of quite recent events and might not actually reflect what was going on in the prehistory of those populations. So this is where actually we paleogeneticists come in because uh, we can uh, try a diachronic or long durée uh, approach to population history. By that I mean we get the ability to actually look at different points in time to see how genetic diversity uh, was distributed in the populations that we observe on a geographic or global level. And we also get the ability to actually monitor other things than just population history, but also um, human genetic adaptation to specific um, environmental and physiological uh, stress factors over time, not relying on models that uh, we need to kind of reconstruct and infer uh, past events, but actually maybe having the chance to directly look at populations at the time where something occurred. So the strengths of our approach that I see, that cannot live without the modern genomics. Just doing ancient DNA alone will not give us the answer. But adding up ancient DNA gives us the, gives us the depth and the detail that we didn't have before uh, to that extent. So, as I said before, modern DNA infers evolution and diversity uh, from modern populations and tries to create models to understand what happened in the past. So we just have uh, actually one point in time where we measure and we take this uh, data that we get to try to reconstruct what might have happened there. And as I said before, taking ancient DNA gives us the opportunity to actually look at different points in time and get an idea of if whatever we inferred before is actually true or if other events happened that shape the population structure, diversity or um, specific um, events that uh, had selective impact on human genomes in the past. Of course, only ancient DNA comes with some downsides. We're limited normally in our sample size that we can work with since there's normally not so many skeletons around. And then there's the additional problem that, of course, ancient DNA means dealing with degraded DNA. So even if we would have all the skeletons of the world, it is possible that only a few of them actually contain suitable genetic material that is preserved for our analyses and um, that it is accessible for us, meaning other factors have to be considered like contaminations that might derive from uh, modern humans interacting with these samples and also other uh, microorganisms that can lead to uh, major um, problems analyzing the data that we do. So, of course, I speak here as if ancient DNA is a new discipline. It isn't. It is around for about 30 years now. I think the first, um, of course, um, explorations into ancient DNA were done here at Berkeley and then the pioneers like Svante Pebel and others brought the discipline all over the world and started to do their research also on questions that are relevant for us, more archaeology uh, interested people. And um, the discipline grew and grew and grew and grew and lots of research was done, but most of the research was done with technologies that we kind of abandoned in the last eight years. So, even though that's not completely true, we still rely on the old methods, but now we have new approaches that give us fascinating insight that we couldn't have before. So, 
I don't want to go too much into details because that will probably be boring for most of you since it is uh, technology driven, but just to give you an idea of what changed in our discipline in the last years. So normally most of the ancient DNA studies that have, to be, uh, have been done until recently just looked at small proportions of the human genomes uh, that you were investigating. Most of that mitochondrial DNA, so DNA that is only inherited in the maternal lineage that actually only gives us insights into maternal population dynamics. So of course if I only look at 50% of the population I might get a completely wrong picture of what might have happened in the past. And then, um, uh, and these limitations were not just because all the people uh, that are involved in this science decided, oh yeah, that's everything we need, but also because mitochondrial DNA is the most easiest target that we can aim for as a paleogeneticist, since mitochondrial DNA, which is found not in the nucleus of a cell, but in the tiny mitochondria that make up kind of the um, uh, energy center of our cells, are there a much higher quantity, meaning that in the living organism already there's a ratio of about 1,000 mitochondria to one nucleus, meaning 1,000 times ni mitochondrial DNA to autosomal nuclear or chromosomal DNA. And that also of course means that after death there's a higher uh, likelihood that mitochondrial DNA is preserved than uh, genomic nuclear DNA. So people were aiming for that and the technologies that we used in the past, PCR, Sanger sequencing and so on, were well suited for this kind of approach. But again, we could only target specific regions of the genome that were normally quite small. Then around 2005, a new technology came up called next generation sequencing, or there are several other names. But this technology was quite uh, rapidly integrated into the ancient uh, DNA canon of methods and you all probably know about the first outcomes of the introduction of that technology into our field and that is uh, the sequencing of a Neanderthal genome, something that would have been impossible using the technologies on this side before. So now it was possible to use a te uh, technology that actually allows us to get the million fold amount of data out of the same uh, sample which in the first moment sounds super amazing and I know that many colleagues use that kind of uh, argument to just say like, yay, that is the solution. But millionfold more tar uh, data of course doesn't always mean that all this data is usable for the end user. So there's complex biochemical and then computational approaches that are necessary to actually mine through the data uh, to get what you're looking for. But still, now some years later, uh, enough development uh, has flown into these technologies that we actually can use this method for all these fascinating things that we were thinking about, not only looking at tiny parts of the mitochondrial genome, but going for whole mitochondrial genomes. And not only mitochondrial genomes, but actually being able to sequence whole genomes of ancient specimen or to target large regions of the genome that are informative for whatever we're looking at, no matter if it's population history or evolutionary biology. The other big uh, benefit of these new technologies is that you can actually target DNA fragments that are much smaller than we could target before. So one of the first observations in this technology shift was there are many samples that we gave up in the past because we were not able to uh, access any genetic information. And now this technology allows us to actually get information out of this, out of this sample. So it doesn't mean just because we didn't get DNA in the past that there was no DNA, but that the DNA was broken down to so tiny pieces that we could simply not access the DNA. And that is something that is possible also now using these new technologies. And other factors like contamination risk and all these things can be lowered applying these new technologies. So of course for our discipline that was the huge hooray and that's also what kind of um, started this uh, huge amount of paleogenomic work that came out in the recent years and is populating nature and science in other journals. Of course, if you're working more in a field that is kind of interested in not in who was the first uh, or questions related to major regions of interest like Europe, um, like me, and you're int more interested in later historic and prehistoric periods 
in the Americas. You might not make it to nature and science with what you do, but it's not about that. It's about uh, the accumulation of knowledge that is now possible that we didn't have before. Oh, I didn't know that I have that feature. Okay, so um, this is just actually what I just said. So compared the classic approach to the new approach, it simply allows us to access data that we were not able to access before. We now have the chance to actually look at genomic information that gives us the same um, insights into maternal as paternal population dynamics, what is of course crucial. And also something that we couldn't really do before, we can now look at subtle population dynamic processes as admixture. Before that, we kind of had to infer migration scenarios from seeing that maybe the diversity in one population changed and more lineages of another kind uh, came up over time, over time. But that kind of always means that there must be kind of a, a significant demographic event that leads to an exchange in the population. But it doesn't really show us if things normal human things happen, like more people from one region go to another region and sexually interact or reproduce with the local populations there. Uh, these are subtle genetic sig signals that we couldn't get before, and now we can actually get those things. We don't have to wait for the major mass migration, uh, but we can actually see if there's a moment in time where maybe there is more gene flow between a region, let's say the Central Andes and the Amazon region or something like that. So that brings me to kind of my major field of research, the population history of South America, or more or less uh, actually the Central Andes. And what I have to say directly in the beginning is that whatever I present you here is work in progress. And it's work that is in progress for now 10 or 11 years. Uh, that simply means that, or should give you an idea how complex the population history of the continent is and how hard it actually is to get into those subtle structures that I'm interested in. If you don't just want to look at who came to the Americas first and at which point in time, but if you really want to see if socioeconomic complexity is a driver for gene flow or not, or um, is coincident with demographic changes, if conflict or interaction between past populations led to also shifts in the populations that we observe, then it gets a little bit more problematic. Especially if you work in um, fields like the Americas, settled last uh, by our species, and also settled by a very uh, restricted population and population size, meaning we face a very low amount of overall genetic diversity. So, and then that whole thing got shut up. Nothing, nobody really comes into the Americas until the European contact. Maybe there were Vikings or something like that before, but we know that they never had a real actual impact on the uh, Native American gene pool. So that means we are working with a population where we don't really see like large scale shifts and changes as you see them in Europe where constantly new groups are coming in, leaving signals that are um, very different from what we observed before. And the same for mainland Asia. So in the Americas, we face the problem of low genetic diversity, uh, what makes it a very hard field, but also kind of a poster boy example to develop new methods that are more sensitive and sensible to actually detect these kind of fine-grained interactions between human societies and populations. So South America is quite well studied when it comes to the overall number of individuals that have been uh, analyzed in the past. Uh, when you look at this graph, it doesn't really matter. You see, and it's actually hard to see, I'm sorry for that, that there's large numbers of individuals analyzed here that, uh, where, where the data already has been published uh, that have been analyzed for mitochondrial DNA or for small fractions of mitochondrial DNA. And this is kind of the main record that we have to talk about population history in South America. For a long time, there were not many people interested in South America, maybe because it's so complicated maybe for other reasons, maybe because most of the samples you get from the overall continent are very bad when it comes to the DNA preservation. So there's actually only, besides me, for a long time, three or four other people that uh, did ancient DNA work there. And most of the data are actually there. I don't want to brag, but it's simply because I can't 
didn't see a reason to shift to another continent is accumulated by me. But it comes with the restrictions that I just mentioned. And now the number of you know, new data qualities that I just mentioned is growing. So we have a large number of complete mitochondrial genomes now that give us completely new insights into the mitochondrial genetic diversity or maternal genetic diversity. And there is also a large number now of genomes or genome-wide data that uh, we generated in the last two to three years with my colleagues together from Boston, David Reich, um, that we are still working on to actually be able to publish. So again, here the results that I show are kind of previous results because it turned out even though we have this wonderful new tool now and we can look at the whole genome and not just mitochondrial DNA, that it is the genetic differentiation between the populations is so low that we actually have a hard time to differentiate and to distinguish on a level that would be of any kind of interest for archaeology. So the oldest samples that have been analyzed so far are about 10,000 years old and we have a pretty uneven spatial distribution meaning that most of the human remains that have been studied come from the central Andes. And this is something that is mainly driven by preservation um, for the overall region of the Amazon basin, there's not many human remains that are um, available. And on the other hand, we have access to um, samples from Brazil, mostly um, the overall environmental conditions were not favorable to um, preserve any kind of organic or genetic material. So it's just the mineral matrix. And then now there's a growing body of um, data coming from the southern cone of South America. There it's simply population sizes, probably not as much, not so many archaeological sites that are known with human remains. And so that, of course, is a limiting factor. And everyone who, knows in the, uh, who works in the Andes knows that there's no place in the world that is probably that crowded with bioarchaeologists like the Central Andes. There's no chance that you go from one little hamlet to the next without meeting a German or US archaeology crew and a bioarchaeologist and so on. So we have a pretty good idea of the overall record. What also is favorable for me because it means that we have a rich um, amount of data from other disciplines that I can use to build my models that I'm working with. So over the years, I gathered a rather large collection of South American samples. We have around 1,800 samples in our collection now at UCSC coming from um, different regions in South America, reaching from around 10,000 years to uh, the European contact. Um, when you look at this map, those tiny um, Blue things here, I did not remember diamonds, um, are samples that are actually like early Holocene, maybe late Pleistocene uh, that we already analyzed. We have sites, iconic sites like La Ricocha, Arroyo Seco, and uh, other sites there. And then a lot of other sites, uh, all the red dots, and actually that's not enough dots, but it was impossible to show them all, um, that represent places that we've sampled. And as you see, of course, there is this major uh, dominance of, the West, uh, of Western South America. So in the last years, besides all my other work, we started to use these new technologies to kind of restart or redo what I've done in the past to see if the higher data resolution can tell us something that we didn't know before. And so we were able to, as I, you saw before, now generate a large number of complete mitogenomes, individuals for which we have whole genomic data. And actually there's an arrow because you see that I just managed to put 1,500 years more <laughs> into my own timeline. Um, and actually that is right, I just remember, because we just got back new radiocarbon dates for a sample that we have from, um, from Patagonia from um, close to Arroyo Seco that actually dates 11,500 years uh, old and had some DNA preserved and we are hoping that we are able to publish that soon. So what did we do with all the data uh, that we got? So what you see here in this map is simply a distribution of those samples for which we were able to get genomic genome-wide data, not only mitochondrial data. The color code shows that of course there's a dominance of later periods, the middle horizon, the late intermediate, where we have the most samples from, and it gets a little bit thinner uh, when we go into the early periods, but that again is driven by the archaeological record and all the pro but also by the preservation that we find. So 
that paper that was already mentioned earlier where we took the mitochondrial data that we generated to look at the initial peopling of the continent. Even though I was saying like, oh, I'm not interested in those questions, if you have the data, you of course also try to contribute to those questions. And so my colleagues at uh, the Australian Center of Ancient DNA Research and I um, looked into the um, maternal mitochondrial diversity of the initial Native American populations and if we can use that information to get a better understanding of the initial peopling process and the subsequent demography of the overall Native American uh, population. And that is possible because we actually can use mitochondrial DNA in a phylogenetic way, so we can generate trees. And when we look at these trees and see specific events of diversification, we can actually correlate these either events with a demographic change because, let's say, as a simply very basic approach, you can say that more uh, or intense diversification also means um, that the population sizes have to increase. And loss of diversity often correlates uh, with the overall loss of population size in a population in a population. So we used that data and um, managed to get a much better calibration of the initial peopling event than what people got before using only modern DNA because we can use our ancient samples actually at different points in time to calibrate uh, what we call molecular dating. And so what we found is that there was indeed, um, of course, an initial population that lived on, in Beringia before it entered um, the Americas. And there was also something uh, that has been called the Beringian standstill before, meaning that we had populations isolated for amount of time in Beringia uh, before they were able to enter the Americas. Before that, the time range of that event was between 20,000 and 30,000 years. What is a very long time period. Uh, what we figured out, and in parallel another group from Copenhagen looking at another quality of DNA, is that this event actually didn't take that long, but that we can narrow it down to a period of 3,000 and 8,000 years. What is kind of crucial information when you think of the overall ecology um, of that specific area, the uh, um, possibility to sustain populations there for a while, and so on. So this overall event was much shorter. Also another thing that we found is that the so-called founding lineages that make up the uh, Native American uh, mitochondrial gene pool actually all kind of diverged or evolved around the same time. Before we used the calibration that we used, there was a large gap between some of these lineages when they might have been evolved, um, actually giving many people a hard time to believe in one initial wave of uh, immigration or a very, let's say, uh, short and um, rapid mode of migration into the Americas. Knowing now that we have this narrow time frame and also all these lineages occurring at the same time means that we can really kind of reconstruct the initial founding population that existed, the people that lived together in a specific amount of population structure, isolated from the rest of the Asian continent, and at one point, as soon as it was possible, um, made its way into um, the Americas, most likely along the coastal route. Because we also see that there is a diversification event uh, that happens before um, the inner route actually opens. So we see a massive increase in uh, genetic diversity that we can correlate with a massive increase in demography. And meaning, or in our interpretation, meaning due to the rapid spread of the populations throughout the Americas, actually a chance is given for populations to um, occupy their own niches, establish their populations, establish new amounts of genetic diversity, and by that also demographically um, go up to larger sizes, much more as if they would have remained on the, uh, in Beringia. So one other big question that normally comes up when it comes to South, the peopling of South America is which routes people took. And uh, there's been lots of discussions if uh, people just moved along the Pacific route or actually if they split it up when entering South America, 
going straight into Amazonia and some taking the Pacific route or maybe just a complete inland route. So what we did is we took all our very old or the oldest individuals that we had and generated full genomes of these individuals and then compared the genetic data and tested several scenarios how individuals in the past related to each other. And one wonderful thing that we could rely on was that we had all these very old individuals along the Pacific route. And we also have some ancient individuals from the Brazilian highlands that we could look at, plus of course all the modern genetic data uh, that is available. And so what we did, and was actually, not even I can read it here, I'm sorry for that, is that we modeled around and looked what scenario is the most likely scenario for a route. And what we found is that populations in Arroyo Seco uh, in the early Holocene are more closely related to populations in the Central Andes than they are to, let's say, Brazilian populations. Meaning that uh, the uh, first idea of a route that follows along the Pacific um, is the, uh, the model that is supported by the genetic data. But we also see that in our, even in Arroyo Seco, and especially if we go a little bit further to the north, we find signatures that must derive or that are more closely related to modern Amazonian populations, saying that there must have been a distinction between those populations and actually there must have been two routes that at one point um, or down here kind of meet each other and start to admix with each other again. So this is kind of, at least from the genomic side, uh, what we see as the kind of final confirmation of the two route scenario, meaning with one initial population of Native Americans, maybe there was, was somebody before, we don't know that yet, but at least for this time frame we have uh, a highly uh, related population that must have diverged from each other around 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. Uh, was um, isolated from each other for a while. Only down here, actually, these populations meet each other. So we took also this genetic information, of course, to learn a little bit more about our later populations that we analyzed, especially from the Central Andes. And what we find and what we see in this tree is actually uh, confirming what I mentioned before. So, Botigiri Ayok, Wari Highlands, Lauricacha, uh, what I cut here, are all central Andean populations dating to different po uh, populations. Lauricacha is relatively old, about 8,000 years old, and the middle horizon and the late intermediate period are relatively recent in the uh, Andean prehistory. Uh, um, so we see that all these populations branch together here in this tree, meaning they are highly related to each other, meaning that it doesn't seem like there have been any large-scale population replacements in the Andes, at least from the time when Lauricacha started to exist until the European contact. And we again also see that they are, they are more closely related to uh, Patagonian populations than they are to Amazonian populations that we have here. So what we thought is very interesting is um, the question of genetic continuity in the Central Andes. And so we took all our individuals coming from different time points, uh, the oldest being 8,000 at this point where we did the analyses, and the youngest being about 900 years old. And what you see in this heat map is um, the amount of shared genetic drift with the modern indigenous populations in this region. So that kind of simply means the genetic distance to those populations. Um, red being the lowest distance that we can observe and what we see is no matter if it's 8,000 years ago or 900 years ago, the closest related populations that we find in South America are always the Central Andean populations. So that speaks for a long period of genetic continuity and also with uh, to a very restricted gene flow into that region from other regions in South America, what is very interesting, I think at least. And then we find, and this is not in this graph, that with the colonial period actually uh, admixture is promoted and this overall dis um, distinction that we see here gets a little bit lower and um, there seems to be more gene flow between regions. Another thing I, I don't want, I, I probably already go over time, is, and this is hard to see, is with all these diversifications that I mentioned, and this is one of these trees that I mentioned before, showing different lineages, mitochondrial lineages, and you see that there's specific times here in the tree where we have 
like many of these new branches that start to exist and then we have times where there's where it's more quiet and not so much happens um, one thing that we also observed in our studies is that actually um, there are very distinct patterns of genetic diversity that we find all over South America but also especially in the Central Andes meaning that we find lineages that are only represented in the northern uh, Peruvian Andes and we find lineages that we only or mostly only find at the central coast of uh, the Andes. That of course points to a limited um, gene flow between those very adjacent regions and also points uh, to the fact that there needed to be some time in an event to establish these distinctions between the populations. Again, pointing to a rapid mode of uh, the peopling of the Americas with groups settling at speci in specific niches and, uh, niches and establishing there for a while without having major interactions with other populations, at least when it comes to reproduction. That, of course, doesn't mean that no trade happened. And then at the end of the pre-Columbian era, we actually can use the same technologies that I mentioned before and the same techniques to see that um, there is something that has a massive impact on the Native American demography. So of course we all expect that because when we look into the historical records we see all these things that happen. But before we did that in 2011, actually other studies just using modern uh, mitochondrial DNA of Native American populations uh, never found anything that could correlate with those historical records uh, talking about mass mortality of Native American populations coincident or correlated with the European contact. So if we use the same calibration technique and uh, throw in ancient data here, you actually see the demography, this is the demo uh, demographic development, how the populations enter the continent, the population sizes go rapidly up in a very fast mode uh, until they reach some kind of plateau and then here where I for whatever reason um, covered the timeline uh, with this text field uh, but believe me it's about 500 to 600 years ago so it's coincident with the European contact we have a massive decline of the population size or the female effective population size we're only looking at mitochondrial DNA here um, that means that there was a population decline of about 50% of the overall female Native American population coincident with the uh, European contact. So that supports many of the things that we know from the historical record, gives us also the chance to quantify the impact. And one other thing that we learn when we look at this blue thing up here is that whatever caused um, this demographic impact was actually quite fast acting, so population sizes were lost pretty quickly, and also that the population, the regular uh, population diversity and uh, demography kind of um, um, catches up or regenerates pretty quickly afterwards. That means not that, of course, the actual census sizes directly went up, and we know from the historical records that that would not be true, but that means that there was a chance for new diversification happening, uh, meaning that whatever uh, led to the population decline, that period, uh, that major effect is not acting anymore. That means we have to look at something that is fast acting, uh, and inflicts uh, mass mortality and that brings us back to the scenarios of disease transmission that we of course all heard about before. But we of course also know that the classical scenarios of um, uh, immune naivety and so on don't hold true, that's not how our immune system works. But when we combine new pathogens with of course um, socio-economic and political stru uh, struggles that come of course with the uh, European contact and the European colonization and also internal conflicts if we just think of the Andes and the civil war um, raging between um, the two Inca emperors around this time. We have enough conflict that weakens the population and makes it um, kind of uh, prone or uh, more vulnerable to these kinds of effects. So as I mentioned before, of course, normally I try to concentrate more on the central Andes in general. And even though we see Machu Picchu here, uh, and I have a project together with my colleague Richard Berger uh, at Yale, where we're looking at the 
uh, burial population found at Machu Picchu. Um, I will not really talk about Machu Picchu here. There's far more interesting things than Machu Picchu. <laughs> So why are the Central Andes so wonderful to do my kind of research? The Central Andes are wonderful, first of all, because they're so overpopulated with anthropologists, archaeologists, linguists, and so on, that you have uh, this rich data that you can rely on. And then also simply because they give you unique environmental features that you hardly find anywhere else in the world. You have these closely adjacent extremely different, envir differing environments, um, the coast, the high altitude mountains, and of course the Amazonian rainforest um, that um, comes with completely different um, environmental pressures and um, factors acting at the human populations living in those regions. Of course this has major impact on the archaeological record and what we can observe in the development of socioeconomic complexity and subsistence strategies, but of course also has impact on uh, selective factors acting on the population here. So we have the high altitude Andes, uh, where of course there are physiological stresses acting on the populations over uh, since uh, the first people started to permanently settle at high altitude that Andean population uh, adapted to over time. And then we have the chance to actually kind of compare these populations to populations that only live 15 miles down the valley uh, and show completely different patterns uh, in their genomic structure even though they are so closely related to each other. So we have a wonderful situation actually to look into in, in situ uh, evolution in our human population. And then of course when it comes to socioeconomic complexity and all those things, I don't have to tell you uh, how interesting it is to see like how different size styles of subsistence and so on inter, uh, correlate with demographic development. Then we also have a very good climate record. Uh, again, you probably cannot read what is there, but this is more kind of a slide to say like we have so many climate records that we can use that is cool. We don't really have that for many other regions and uh, the number is growing and growing. So we also can throw that into our models and uh, look at specific things. And then of course we have an amazing cultural diversity that we see through the, see through the pre um, Columbian period. Uh, we have a very kind of rapid mode of increasing socioeconomic complexity in the Andes, much more rapid than in many other regions of the world, ranging from um, archaic and maybe Paleo-American periods to early states in the Middle Horizon uh, to the Inca Empire. So we have all these kind of rapid socioeconomic and political changes that of course will have had influence on the demography and since the periods in between are also very short that allows us to get an idea of the impact on demography and um, genetic diversity that we can hardly find in other regions. So as I said I'm working in the Andes over 10 years now and got quite a bit of data um, to look at and of course most of this is mitochondrial data. So the first question is even though I said before we see overall genetic continuity in the Andes, is there something happening when we just look at the Andes? And the wonderful thing that you might see in this map is yes, something is going on. So what this map is simply showing us is Peru first and then the genetic distance of the past populations at a specific point in time from the modern Peruvian population. And what you see is that here at the oldest point in time, here marked at 2500 BCE, so where we have large populations that actually cover all of Peru, not of course populations were there, but where we have large sets of samples where we can actually model in space because we have data points all over the country. Um, we see that um, low distances to the modern populations are actually just found in the south while um, populations up in the north and the central Andes were actually quite uh, distant from uh, modern populations. And then we see that these things shift over time and actually um, what we read out of this development is there's a process of genetic homogenization or loss of genetic structure that happens over time that might of course correlate with um, human activities, migration and social uh, political changes um, that correlate with 
the onset of the Wari Empire or the Incas or something like that. Um, we also see that kind of, or what we, this uh, graph here suggests is that whatever kind of is the dominant pattern of genetic diversity that is dominant today kind of derives from the south, from the south central highlands and so on. So again, we took our genomic data, and I'm sorry, my graphs are all so bad. Um, just to show, we thought like, okay, that is only mitochondria data, so something might be there that we oversee. So we looked at the nuclear data, again, showing us the demography of and genetic diversity of male and female population components. And what we find if we throw some genomes in the pool is actually kind of a comparable picture. We see here all the older ancient DNA samples that we had branching closely together in the tree. And then we have our youngest ancient DNA sample that we had in the mix that dates into the late intermediate period, around 1100 AD, actually being closer to uh, modern Bolivian, Quechua, and Aymara po uh, populations than those ancient. In general, but still, this tree shows us that all these populations closely branch together, meaning, yes, there is continuity in the Andes. There is not much going, coming in from the outside for a long time, but there is a substructure in the Andes, so there is population dynamics happening that are visible in the genetic structure of those populations over the period of 8,000 years that we're looking at. So we did another test where we tried to model whatever is happening, and uh, when you look at this weird tree here, you actually see here in this red dot uh, all our oldest genomes that we have from uh, the central Andes. Uh, and over here you have the modern Aymara and Quechua populations. And right here in the middle, again, we have our late intermediate uh, Peruvian population that we're looking at. And we get a signal, we get an estimate of admixtures saying that at the late intermediate period, at this point of time, actually um, the population had about 40% ancestry of these older populations here that come from all over Peru, all over the central Andes, and 60% of the ancestors of the Aymara and Quechua me, being more the southern Peruvian, southern central Andean uh, events. So again, showing that there's something going on, people are migrating through the Andes, and it seems like uh, the, uh, the, the dominant source of this process actually comes from the ancestors of what are the Amara and Quechua population, speaking populations today. I don't want to do the same mistake as any other, or many other population geneticists to directly refer uh, linguistic groups to uh, actual populations. So, actually, before that, but it fits good uh, to what we observed to get an idea of what might have been happening. Uh, in the past, we had this wonderful Palpa Valley time transect uh, project where we were able to uh, look into a very wonderful archaeological record over um, 5,000 to 6,000 years um, and where we also had the possibility to um, study populations from the high altitude Andes, populations from the lower valleys at the coastal desert and populations deriving directly from the coast and to see over time in a diachronic manner how these populations interact with each other and to correlate that with the archaeological and the climatological record. So one thing that you have to know about this region in southern Peru, the most iconic cultures that we know there in the pre-Columbian time are the Paracas culture from about 800 BC to 200 AD, uh, no, to 200 BC, and then the Nazca culture, most famous for their gigantic geoglyphs, and of course because people thought that these geoglyphs could just have been created by um, aliens and not by humans. Um, being dominant in these lower valleys there. And then in the upper valleys, we have the influence later of the um, early, um, uh, early state societies like the Wari Empire and so on. So the first thing I can say is we found no alien DNA. <laughs> and it's good to say that because there's lots of YouTube videos and so uh, out now by, I think the guy is named Brian Bauer, I forgot his name. Uh, who studied some, or st still thinks that um, these wonderful Paracas skulls that have these intentional skull deformations, that are pretty amazing, cannot be actual human beings, but must be either aliens 
or Nephilim, meaning the um, children of angels inter sexually interacting or reproducing with humans. And so this guy is around since a while and always tries to find people that do his genetic work for him to support his claim. Actually, quite recently, a uh, lab took his samples and analyzed it and got no results. And he took that, and first, no, first time he got no results and he used that to support his claim that it must be aliens because if they're aliens, we cannot read their DNA. So we can think, you know, when we teach our undergrads how to approach the scientific method, that's, yeah. And now they found European DNA on a sample, um, which came from the United States from a collection and has been there for 100 years. So lots of things could have happened to the sample. And they found a European haplotype. And now he has this new idea that actually these are kind of early Europeans that were brought over by aliens or the angels or something like that. So I can try, uh, show you, tell you I analyzed about 150 Paracas individuals with wonderful skulls. And when I got DNA, the DNA preservation is very bad. It was always Native American DNA. So what I found looking at this time transact is that actually um, we were able to reconstruct the genetic relationships of, of those populations over time to each other. Don't worry so much about the numbers. Uh, the main observation that we actually made and that is interesting is that at the coast and at the foothills we see population continuity from the earliest times that we were able to sample until the middle horizon. Meaning that there have been no larger migrations that came into that region from regions that are genetically distant um, that shaped or were kind of part of major cultural transitions that we observed there. But then in the, in the late intermediate period, the latest period that we're looking at, actually the genetic di uh, distance increases rapidly. So something must have happened. The populations from the middle horizon are absolutely distant from the late intermediate periods. Speaking for or suggesting population discontinuities. And the other thing when we look at the highlands is that um, the coastal populations are actually quite distant from the highland populations, even though we talk about a geographic distance of 50, uh, 50 miles, but going up 3,000 to 4,000 meters into the upper valleys. And then in the late intermediate period, actually there is no genetic distance between the highlands and the coast anymore meaning that, or suggesting that maybe a major migration or population replacement might have happened from uh, the highlands to the coast. So we modeled a little bit around and took our climate data uh, that we have and the settlement density data. And what the settlement density data first shows is here, blue coast, uh, green highlands is that we have kind of growing population sizes or settlement sizes uh, into the Nazca period and then at the end of the Nazca period actually there's less settlements, the region is nearly abandoned in the middle horizon so the time of the Wari state and then in the late intermediate period there's a huge amount of new uh, settlements uh, that are there. So of course that kind of uh, fit it with the observations that we made in the genetic data, but that of course just is coincidence and doesn't say much. And also what we know from the climatic record, and that's comp not shown here, is that these coincident with these major settlement uh, periods here, there's shifts in the overall precipitation that we can observe. So we're at the desert, fringe of the desert, and the desert margin shifts up uh, the Andes and back through uh, to the coast uh, over time, meaning that there's periods where the lower uh, valleys are more favorable uh, to occupy and periods where they're less favorable. This gap here actually falls into a um, period uh, of nearly complete desertification, meaning there's no direct precipitation at all and also the um, precipitation in the highlands, so what runs down the uh, valleys, is pretty low simply showing that that might have made it hard for people to survive uh, uh, there and to sustain populations. And then in the short period where our population sizes go up, there's actually an, uh, a 250 year period where precipitation becomes, uh, increases massively and we actually have direct precipitation down to the lower valleys, meaning um, availability of water. 
That, of course, reminds us very much of climate determinism. I have a little bit differentiated view on that. But let's say when you live on the fringe or on the de desert margin, the availability of water is, of course, a factor that you have to consider, especially if you want to sustain growing populations in more complex societies. What we did, we took our genetic data, took the settlement density data and all the uh, um, other data that we had and generated several models that we then tested using Bayesian statistics uh, to see if there's something happening and if we can actually see that migration happen. And what we found is that there's actually a massive migration percent where about um, 25% of the coastal um, population was exchanged by um, um, highland populations. 25 doesn't sound much, but in genetic terms, that is huge. That is a mass migration event and not a subtle trade diaspora or whatever um, event. And what we also find is that there is an earlier migration event that is much smaller happening around the end of the Nazca culture. So people are leaving the area, we expected that, and it seems they are moving actually up the mountains, but don't have enough impact at this time to actually leave a signal in the high altitude populations of admixture um, that kind of um, lowers the genetic distance that we observe. But then this large amount of new settlement seems to derive from larger populations that come from high altitude going down to the coast. And what we also see is, uh, or also uh, what, what I thought was very exciting, is we get a date um, where actually the highland uh, populations and the coastal population split from each other. So what we see is that it's not something that uh, results from the initial peopling of the region. So some people moved in the highlands, some people moved to the coast, but actually that the split that causes the genetic distance that we observe is pretty recent in terms of the prehistory and happens around uh, 1400 to 1180 BCE. So in a period that we call the initial period, actually the period where um, all over the central Andes, uh, peoples for the first time shift to larger scale agriculture and agriculture has been around, or horticulture has been around for long and the bad thing with South America is all these things that we have in Europe with the Neolithic transition don't work there because it's actually a subsequent and slow process but here it's the first time where people actually rely on staples, maize and so on uh, on a large scale and so I don't have an explanation for that and that is actually something for the archaeologists but what I think based on my understanding of migration theory and human behavior uh, what we also have around this time is the formation of more distinct cultural features and all that stuff so there is differentiation that is visible in the um, subsistence strategies of people between the highlands and the coast of course but also uh, differentiation in the cultural features and identity that might be related to that is often one of the major factors that um, limits the possibility for people to actually reproduce with each other. So limits gene flow. So maybe what we see here is kind of what borders do to people, separating them from each other even in a genetic way. But of course, I know that there's no strict borders around this time and not that uh, the archaeologists just like get the pitchforks and <laughs> get me out of the building here. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting to think about what could have initiated that split around this time. So I'm just talking about coincidence and coincidence is, of course, nothing more than coincidence. So these nice slides here are just... Um, what I said before in a more graphical way, I should have so showed, that, showed that before. So we have the split uh, that happens between the populations. And then when we take together the climate record, we see that an initial migration from the coast to the highlands happens in a period where we, are, where we have actually have prolonged droughts around the coast and probably more favorable weather uh, on the eastern sides of the Andes. Uh, at a time where actually also the first states are established there, so we have Wari and Tiwanaku in those regions. Uh, increasing political um, um, polities that of course also attract people to go there because um, there's labor, there is resources, so it must not be 
the climate that drives the people, but actually changes in general political structure and subsistence that are of course to some point affected also by the climate, but actually maybe um, living up there was more tempting around this time. And then several hundred years later we see the reverse movement and that kind of correlates again with this time of precipitation at the coast and the climate, uh, climatic uh, record also shows that we have prolonged droughts actually in those regions occupied by the Wari and the Tiwanaku. So we have large accumulated populations living in these states relying on very complex systems of agriculture to sustain the population surplus um, uh, economic systems that have to shift in their activities because the environmental factors um, alter. And we know if it's driven by the climate or not that of course the Wari Empire and the Tiwanaku uh, Empire collapse and those political entities don't exist anymore and their centralizing factors also not. So um, all these factors might be triggers for populations moving from A to B, moving to other regions. And then if you have regions that actually turn out to be quite beneficial to sustain a population because there's lots of water and in general it's nicer to live at low altitude as than at whole, uh, um, um, high altitude. Um, these kind of mixture of climatic changes and socio-political changes might have driven massive migrations from the southern highlands into the rest of Peru and by that we come to some kind of event that might also explain all the things that we observed before uh, this homogenization that we observe all over Peru that is driven by a southern Andean genetic signal. Um, so the interesting thing behind it is it is pre-Inca, so it is not the large empire uh, that seems to drive this homogenization and it also seems to be post Wari and Tiwanaku, so it's also not those empires driving that. So it's actually the collapse of the centralized systems and um, the um, advent of small-scale polities uh, and completely changing interaction between regions here uh, that are not controlled by larger powers anymore that might be the trigger for these kind of population movements that we observe. And that also of course means that this is pre-European contact so that actually here before the Inca and before the Europeans we actually find um, the genetic um, diversity in Central Andean populations that we still find today. So the modern genetic diversity of these populations is shaped by these uh, pre-Columbian, late prehistoric events. Sorry that I used the term prehistoric. I know that's not good when I talk about South America, but as a trained or also trained European archaeologist, that is kind of the appealing term for me to talk about that. So I'm coming to an end. I see that I'm already 15 minutes over time. Um, so I just, that is the main thing that I wanted to talk about uh, before and then I just wanted to say that of course there's all these other things that we can look at. It's not only population history and archaeology of course but also this wonderful chance to now where we have this genome wide data to look at human evolution and human adaptation and one thing that I'm actually interested in uh, as I said before how biology and culture interact in shaping the diversity of our species nowadays. Uh, something that relates of course to the concept of niche construction, the feedback effect, rather than a linear or just evolutionary um, perspective on um, how uh, diversity is generated. And so I actually just have it as teasers here. Um, you already heard that I did research into um, high altitude adaptation and hypoxia and that is of course and so far interesting because um, the idea that populations established quite early at high altitude uh, around 10,000 to 12,000 years ago quite shortly after people entered the Americas um, is quite stunning for many people uh, especially when you have been to high altitude on your own you know that you have all these um, rather negative um, physiological reactions to being in a high altitude, mainly driven by hypoxia. 
So you might suffer from mountain sickness, uh, cerebral edema, edema, and so on. And on the long term, it actually also has an impact on the demography of the populations because uh, hypoxia leads to reduced birth weights and increases the chance of stillbirths in those populations. So the question is, if populations actually managed to establish there 10,000 years ago, and when we think of all these well-known cultures and groups and archaeological groups from um, South America, they're actually all high-altitude populations. Something must have happened that allowed them to survive there. Something must have happened to enable them to survive in this more or less, more or less hostile environment for humans. And so, of course, one thing can be genetic adaptation, but genetic adaptation, uh, adaptation is rather slow. So what we found is that actually genetic selection and adaptation is happening over a long time frame, uh, but um, to reach the genetic diversity or the genetic uh, patterns and adaptations that we find in modern Andean populations, it actually takes a very long time. We see the same frequencies for specific genetic markers that we analyzed um, in the ancient populations in modern populations popping up around, yeah, also the late prehistoric period. It's meaning that there must have been something else that allowed those people to survive and that brings us back to niche construction. So there must be cultural adaptations, economic um, subsistence adaptations that actually facilitate genetic adaptation over time. So human activity and behavior gives time for the genetics to actually act slowly and adapt. And of course there might be also other features that we're just starting to explore. There's of course not just the genome, and the culture, we all, all know now that there's things like the epigenome that we can look at as a direct mechanism that modulates the way how genetic information is translated and stands in, uh, is, in, is directly informed by environmental factors. And also um, microbiome, so all these organisms living in us and on us uh, that have major impact on population, on the environmental fitness of an individual and um, the survivability of an individual. So there's lots of things to come, but what we can say is, of course, that there must have been things majorly driven by economic adaptations and um, cultural adaptations that have facilitated genetic um, evolution. And that is interesting because that is a wonderful example for niche construction showing how our behavior and how our culture has become a part of our own biological diversity. And then, of course, there's the question of disease transfer. Um, I told you that we found that we have these massive decreases of population sizes coincident with the European contact. Uh, but we actually, what we want to figure out next is if it was really just the diseases, which diseases were it, and also if there was a differential mortality in uh, Native American populations. So if, let's say, some populations or individuals had specific genetic markers that made them less susceptible to these introduced, um, to these introduced uh, pathogens, meaning if there was some kind of selective impact that acted on the populations too, so not only an undirected loss uh, or mass mortality, but actually uh, um, directed impact on the populations that massively shaped the gene pool of those populations towards a direction um, of individuals that have a reduced susceptibility to these kind of diseases. And that, of course, is something that is also of interest when we think of public health and especially of public health of Native American populations today because it can help us maybe to understand some symptoms that we observe in a much better way uh, than we did in the past. Concluding everything, I hope I managed to show you um, that actually South America and especially the Central Andes are very dynamic when it comes to their population history and that we still are far from really understanding everything but that, we, that I probably have enough work for the rest of my career uh, <laughs> to uh, work on this topic. And, and that what we observe there and what observes the genetic diversity and the general di human diversity in Native American populations of South America and of course also subsequently in mixed populations um, is driven by social and natural uh, environments, meaning that there is not simply a scenario where one specific genetic makeup pops up and is continuous until the next pops up, that, but that 
our behavior and our interaction with the environment actively shapes um, the genetic diversity. Um, that genet uh, that uh, actually these processes also shape the central Andean gene pool in so far that it gets uh, very homogeneous and that this is not related to the major empires or the European contact and yeah, and that there's lots of work to do to actually dig through those patterns of low genetic diversity and a relatively short population history to design tools that help us to understand that better and then ultimately actually also design tools that allow a transdisciplinary approach to all these things which then would in my eyes finally allow to actually do something that is worth being called population history. Thank you very much. And I, of course, want to thank all these wonderful people that take part in my research. That is, of course, not just a one-person effort. It's my own lab. It's the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in Vienna, Germany, the Pontificat Universidad Católica de Peru, the Reich Lab in Harvard, and the Australian Center for Ancient DNA. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure you'll take a few questions before we move in. We'll just do a few, and then the rest will Yeah, I'm more. very sorry that I shortened the time for well, questions. Time to eat, I'm sure, <laughs> but you'll take those questions, I hope. Of course. Uh, thank you for an interesting talk. Um, I'm interested in the uh, uh, response to hypoxia because um, in the in Himalayas there has been uh, noted uh, a set of mutations in the uh, uh, proyl hydroxylases mm. that are related to uh, uh, hemoglobin production in terms of hypoxia sensor. My understanding is that those sets of, of isoforms don't exist in the Andes. Um, what genes do you use mm -hmm. as an index of response to hypoxia, given that the hypoxia sensor genes don't seem to have uh, mutated in mm -hmm. the way that they did in the, in the Himalayas? No, that's really a fascinating question, especially one, it points to the fascinating aspect of altitude adaptation so that we have convergent evolution. We have these distinct populations that adapted to high altitude in different ways. And of course also have different genes, all the same genes involved, but different polymorphisms that control that. And of course, Rasmus Nielsen, who is here at Berkeley, did some fascinating studies on um, populations from the Himalaya, and I think he also works on some Andean populations. Uh, and he probably would even be the much better uh, colleague to talk with in this um, point. So what we did is we looked at some genes that have been identified before in genome-wide scans to probably be under the influence of selection. Um, this would be antioxidant? Yes, so it is uh, EGLN1, um, EPAS, so it's things that are involved in the broader metabolism. And then another gene that is not directly uh, um, included there, that is NOS3, uh, which is um, part, of course, of the nitric oxide um, uh, metabolism. And um, now we expanded our panels actually on a much wider scale to include far more genes because uh, the first approach that we had was relatively naive. We just took whatever was identified in the modern record and looked if we see a signal in the ancient uh, record. Uh, but of course that limits us very much in really understanding the dynamics because as you mentioned there, the, the genes or the SNPs that we identify, the polymorphisms that we identify to be under selection don't correlate with any direct physiological reaction. So they're not, neither directly translated in a way, nor are they kind of structurally involved in any of these metabolisms. So actually what we see is, yeah, there's selection acting, but, and we assume that it is correlated with uh, altitude adaptation, but it could also be something different. And that is one of the major problems that you have with ancient DNA, that of course we cannot look at phenotypes. I cannot ask the, um, 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 measure uh, nitric oxide content and all these things in one of my skeletons. So I'm, 
I have to look at modern population studies and take that and transfer that to the ancient populations. And as you, you might know that even though anthropologists have been working on al high altitude adaptation since I think biological anthropology is around, um, just in the recent years actually geneticists started to focus on a large scale level on this topic. And there's still kind of a divide between those classic physiological studies and the genetic studies where those people don't really kind of interact with each other or don't read the literature of each other um, to bring together these things. So I have to say right now I don't have a satisfying answer to that. I can say that the genes that I analyze are broadly involved in these uh, processes, but actually the polymorphisms that we found to be under selection are in no way directly involved in the translation or in the structure of the uh, translation process. So I know that there's selection happening. <laughs> I, I, I hope that I know more. And as I said, we now have a more widespread approach where we target all the genes that are um, part of these uh, metabolic pathways. Um, we also have modern individuals that we integrate in our study, uh, indigenous populations that get a go a little bit, give us a more diversity than what, because one of the problems is that it, whenever you talk about genomics in the central Andes, you actually normally just have like a handful of individuals that normally just derive from either something that was termed Aymara or something that was termed Quechua. There's a little bit more diversity in the altitude studies, but we don't have a good understanding actually. And so now we have the um, benefit of interacting with Peruvian colleagues who actually have wonderful collections of samples from people where they have the whole biography of the individuals, all the anthropological information that you want. So you can actually be sure that these individuals come from these regions, see their ancestry in these regions and so on. And it's not just a di di diffuse thing that has been termed Quechua just following a major description of a language group. And I hope that this will allow us to actually then also go deeper into these processes. Because there will also be diversity, you know. Um, you will not only find differences between uh, Tibetan populations and Andean populations, you will find differences between populations in the northern Andes and in the southern Andes, especially if these divides that we observed in the genetic data, uh, the population uh, data, mean that there was not much gene flow between these regions. Still, they are all adapted to that uh, thing, so there will be also convergent evolution on the small scale that acted, I assume. Any other questions? One in your I have a question. So a lot of the homogenization data that was from mitochondrial data. Yes. I was wondering what you think will happen when you start to be able to sequence nuclear DNA and if you think that that pattern will hold up. It does to some extent as far as we can see it now. Um, as I said, the problem with homogenization and the nuclear genome right now is that everything looks very homogenous. Um, because we have this kind of lack of diversity. And actually it turns out that right now mitochondrial DNA with what we have is a much better marker to distinguish because there's more mitochondrial diversity that we can deal with uh, between the regions than, um, uh, than uh, nuclear diversity. Uh, but this process that or this model here actually points towards what we observe in the homogenization. So we see that there is some kind of genetic structure in the past and that um, these archaic and older ancient individuals um, are to some extent distinct from these modern populations. And we also see that in the same period where we see this kind of mitochondrial homogenization process, uh, we have this period where actually an admixture event happens that brings in the ancestral uh, the, the, uh, that and mixes the ancestral populations of these Aymaras and Quechuas with those older northern and central Andean populations, northern and central central Andean populations um, that we observed before. So this uh, has the same uh, direction that we observe in the mitochondrial data. So we are talking about populations found in the southern central Andes here. And uh, as we saw it in all the mitochondrial stuff, and also points towards, even though that's a mixture and not homogenization, but it also shows that this, domin uh, that this signal from the south actually becomes dominant, taking up 60% uh, 
of the genomic diversity that we observe in these individuals. So it seems like also in the nuclear data we see this homogenization process, but we cannot completely and satisfyingly um, uh, validate this hypothesis because we simply have to find better ways to mine the data and actually get those kind of subtle processes um, better pinned down in the data. But it looks like it all fits at this point. But uh, again, that is not, of course, the final um, verification of my hypothesis. Can I add on to that, Louis? Um, linguistics. Uh, mm -hmm. Lev Michael, who teaches here mm -hmm. in the linguistics department, um, suggests from his very detailed pan South American study, and I, I'm heartbroken and I didn't think to invite him. I should have. You should talk to him. He proposes linguistically that people are migrating from the south out of the Chaco, out of this mm -hmm. sort of Argentine eastern slope area, that there seem to be a long-term relationship with the southern highlands and that area and that they're moving north. And that would reflect you know, what we're seeing genetically. And he's taking that from the, the language of mm -hmm. relationships, humanic relationships, and that, that that would be his suggestion of where Aymara actually is coming from. That's that is very interesting yeah. because my linguists that I work with, so Paul Haggerty uh, right. and so, of course, have a complete different stand. And right. even though we're in a think tank together um, by the Max Planck um, and where we try to actually have this transdisciplinary approach, so we're linguists, geneticists and so on, there is this constant struggle between me and uh, the linguists and our linguist, uh, or especially with Paul, um, I love him, but just scientifically. Not to love, because you might have more. Uh, uh, Hugh, and what he, his models don't fit with the genetic data, not at all. He sees that the major empires are the um, major factors that distribute languages through the Andes, and also, of course, says that Aymara most likely has been distributed in the context of the um, Chavin um, um, pan Andean. Um, Oh my God! <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, Pan-Andean uh, Pan -Andean development, meaning, of course, with Chagrin, we don't expect that there's kind of a state-like structure that majorly expands, but at least that we see that there's some kind of, of, of mentality. Exactly, and that this was one of the major driving factors, and then that Quechua is actually distributed by the Wari Empire, and meaning by that that Quechua is actually kind of distributed more in a political and military manner as an whatever organizing language in the Wari Empire. And that, of course, if you really want to correlate language with population movement, that wouldn't fit with what we see. But again, I think that sometimes, of course, there might be actually other effects that trigger the dispersal of language uh, completely differently from population well, I mean, dispersals. Not to go on. Last thing I'll mm. say, and we'll stop. Um, he's not alone, Michael. Mm. Uh, the French linguists mm. also have this southern no, and that's very interesting, actually, because gone. that would make sense when we observe that. And when there is a correlation between population movement and language, that would be a fascinating, fascinating scenario. One wonderful thing, now that I know that, is that I just last week was offered new samples, not directly from the Chaco, but at least I wanted a map here, but I don't find a map here. Uh, from the eastern um, Andes, so um, from the Argentinian regions, um, eastern slopes of the Argentinian Andes, um, also kind of a time transact ranging from at least 6,000 uh, before to uh, Inca period. Uh, that would, of course, be a wonderful um, thing to integrate into that scene and see how these populations relate to our southern central Andean populations and so on. That's really fascinating. Um, I really need to read his work. Okay, I'll get on to that. <laughs> anyway, so um, I think it's, uh, he's been talking for uh, an hour and a half, so let's all move into the atrium. And where there's Thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> <laughs>